join us. Bienvenidos y gracias por tomar a uh, tiempo de su horario para ser parte de esta reunión. And I am going to turn it over to Sarah. She's going to be our MC for the evening. Y voy a pasarle los micrófonos a Sara. Ella va a ser nuestra MC de la tarde. Um, Jesus or Jennifer, it looks like um, some people are having trouble logging in. If we could paste the Zoom link into this chat. I just noticed that before we start. Parece que alguien está teniendo problemas para poder entrar a la reunión. Se va a pegar en el enlace en el chat. O se va a copiar el enlace en el chat si alguien lo necesita. So, um, uh, for Spanish, this, this meeting will also be in Spanish. We have a, an interpretation channel set up in the Zoom. So if you would like interpretation, select the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen and choose Spanish. So from here on out, Spanish will be on that channel and English will be in this channel. Si usted necesita servicios de interpretación, tenemos los servicios disponibles para poder escuchar en español la reunión. Por favor, seleccione el botón de interpretación en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Si usted necesita español, se va a este canal y si no, se queda en este que estamos ahorita actualmente. Ok, so just a couple of virtual meeting reminders for tonight. Everyone's going to stay muted and have their videos off to start with. If you have any questions or comments during this meeting, go ahead and type them into Zoom, the Zoom chat at any time. We'll have someone monitoring that. Um, and at the end, we'll have time for everyone to come off mute and turn their cameras on and we can have an open discussion with questions and answers. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. And I know you just said we're all muted, but uh, I know many people that are trying to get in, but there's no passcode because it's asking for a passcode. Um, do you happen to know what that is? Let me uh, let me look for that. I didn't. I don't believe I set this up with a passcode code, but but clearly due to the issue. So, um, Sarah, if you want to continue, I'll I'll look in the background and uh, that we get people in. Okay. Do we want to wait or do we do we want to just go? Uh, I think the the first kind of uh, the house cleaning and things like that. If we want to go through through those slides, okay. Um, and then if we want to stop right when we're starting to get into the meet to make sure that we do get everyone in here. Okay. So tonight we are going to just do a project recap, reorient ourselves to this project where we are in the timeline and uh, what we've done so far. We'll talk about the community engagement number one results and feedback, and then we'll get into your questions and discussion. So to reintroduce you to our team again, I'm Sarah. I'm the project manager from Design Workshop. We're the lead designer for this project. We've also got Rob and Alex here from Design Workshop. And then you can see we've got a whole list of collaborators, designers, and engineers that are also helping us out with this project. We've also got you guys, the community and our stakeholders. And we've got our team from the city of Denver. So uh, Jennifer is on the line and Claudia is on the line and so is Jesus. So where are we in this project? Just to recap, the last time we met, we were looking for input to revise the site plan that was created in 2019. So we got a lot of good feedback from this group and the community from our first public meeting and incorporated that into our revised design, which we will present tonight. Um, so now here we are again to show you that and get more feedback. Um, we are planning to meet one more time after this in the fall uh, before we complete our construction documents for this project. Um, and I guess I'll just stop here. We're kind of getting into a meet. <laughs> uh, do we have, do we want to Wait for people or continue on? I'll just add a quick 
note to that to the login situation as well for those who are trying to help people um, the event link via facebook worked just fine um, however when you copy and pasted the link to spread awareness it that's the one that's not working so if people are directing people to the facebook event um, that is the way to go to get logged on just as a, a help to all of that thank you jackie Um, Jesus, do you think we want to pause or and wait for some more people to join or keep going? Um, I think, you know, if, if we're comfortable, we will record this portion. So as people join and if, if they miss, they won't have to watch the entire meeting and just the first, uh, the first section. Okay. And Sarah, if I can jump on real quick. Sure. I just want to say a thank you to Councilman Clark's office for being here. We appreciate you taking the time to join us. Awesome. So here is that plan from 2019 that we showed you the last time we met. Uh, this plan was a starting point for us as designers and we got a lot of good feedback and had a really great discussion with all of you and the community members. And so we took that and we incorporated it into a revised design. What did we hear from public engagement number one? Well, we had over 220 survey participants. So thank you all for participating and spreading the word. And we had over 300 comments. Uh, from, from that survey. And there is an FAQ document that Parks and Rec has put together that takes specific or very popular comments that we saw and addresses them in a very detailed manner. And that will be posted to the project website um, along with other project information. So check out the project website for that FAQ. There were a few things from uh, this engagement session that we heard again and again things that stuck out to us and um, things that were repeated by many people. And we saw this both from the survey questions and the open-ended comments. And after we introduce the revised concept plan to you, we'll specifically focus on the ways that we address these. So we heard reduce the amount of parking, the parking lots are too close to the existing neighborhood. We heard uh, that people would like to see more green space in this plan and create more space for flexible recreation, place to places to play soccer or other pickup sports. We heard a lot of people talk about including a skate park. Um, and then we also heard some comments about the sports courts that maybe they're striped for multiple activities. Uh, when we check out the comments by category, so this is specifically looking, out, looking at open-ended comment feedback and categorizing them. Uh, most of the comments fit into these uh, categories that you see here. And as I said before, we'll get into a little bit of more detail of how we took this feedback and incorporated it into the plan. But generally, we overwhelmingly saw comments about the skate park. Um, the second most popular comment we saw was about fields and open and green space and creating room for flexible recreation on grass. The third was about the existing pool, which Unfortunately, due to costs, we're not going to be able to put back into commission as part of this project, but we did hear this concern and we have tried hard to keep the splash pad and water play a substantial park element and a vital part of this project. The fourth most comments was about parking, which you'll see soon that we've tried to reduce and relocate throughout the site. And the least amount of comments that we saw surrounded the community building, the sports courts and community art. Uh, favorite park elements ranked number one, tie for number one was the splash pad and the bike playground. Uh, the second favorite community building, number three picnic areas. Oh, sorry. Second place tied community building and sports courts. Number three was picnic areas. So there were a number of comments that we made note of, but that we will not be covering today or throughout this project as they're outside of our project scope and involve initiating external agencies that just don't have to do with this project. Um, so any comments related to Levitt Pavilion parking or operations of the Levitt Pavilion will be handled separately with that team outside of this project. And then any comments or concerns regarding the walking loop throughout the entire park 
will need to be addressed separately with Denver Parks and Rec, and we're just unable to talk about these items today. So there was also a number of comments that we heard about the master planning process in general. And so we kind of wanted to just um, break down that process before we get into the plan today. We heard um, questions like, when is this master plan that you keep talking about from? Why are we using it? Um, why is it from so long ago? Questions like that. So what is a park master plan and how does it work? The, there was a master plan that was done in 2008 for Ruby Hill Park. Um, this, the purpose of this master plan was to provide a comprehensive framework for the future land use and park development in Ruby Hill. This document was a guide that was put together with years of community input and its de development is required in order to help the city um, prioritize development and acquire funding and plan construction projects. So a master plan is really the first step in implementing these real tangible improvements. And so thanks to this master planning process, there have been several implementation phases since this document was finished. So there was one in 2011, phase one, and one in 2016, phase two. Both funding and construction take many years and a lot of logistics. So just to put it into perspective, this phase three that we're all here for tonight began in 2018 and it's not projected to be completed till 2023. So master plans are typically projected out 15 to 25 years in the future. But at each implementation phase, the city comes back to the community to gain current input from current community members on the construction and the design, which is why we're all here tonight. So thanks for being here. So just to recap the different phases, the first implementation phase included the picnic pavilion and the associated parking lot. It also included the playground that's in the park today. And then it also uh, removed this portions of this internal road network to try to discourage fast driving, um, racing around the park and unwanted vehicular behavior. Phase two, pretty big, included Levitt Pavilion and the BMX park. And phase three, why we're here today. Uh, so we'll be implementing improvements from that original master plan in this upper court area. So that includes the splash pad, flexible recreation zones and picnic areas, as well as some new uses such as the bike playground, a skate park and the community building that will house the gear library. So here is our revised plan. Uh, I can walk us through this. So the community building is pretty much in the same location uh, with an entry plaza surrounding it. We've got the bike playground uh, plan right of that. The bike playground will have uh, a couple of different loops that will be able to allow users to progressively grow their skills um, and it will become more and more challenging as you progress throughout the bike playground. The splash pad is, is still in the plan. Uh, directly adjacent to what we're calling a family lawn. So this is really meant to um, be a spillover picnic space for people using the splash pad or the bike playground, um, a place where you can picnic and lay down without feeling like you're in the way or about to get kicked in the head with a soccer ball. Uh, to the right of that, we have a flexible recreation zone. So this has both hard court flex recreation and grass flexible recreation. Uh, we've tried to expand this grass area. Um, we chose this portion of the site because, as you know, there is a lot of topography at Ruby Hill. So it, in order to find a naturally flat space was a bit of a challenge. So we've tried to maximize that in this location. We've also added a skate park into this project as an additional program. We heard a lot of feedback from that uh, at our last meeting, and we thought that it fit really nicely with the program of this area. Um, we have a beginner bike playground, and we'll also have a beginner skate park that will work similarly to the bike playground in that there will be really um, fundamental features that will allow people to learn how to skateboard, how to scooter, um, and progress their skills. Then we've also got picnic areas scattered throughout um, and then parking. 
So we have reduced the amount of parking in this area, and we've expanded some parking spaces along this existing drive. Uh, and we've also expanded this existing parking lot um, and added a couple of spaces there as well, which we will get into um, in detail in a little bit. So here is what that looks like. This is a view looking north. You can see the community building on the right hand side, the bike playground, the splash pad to the left of the screen, and the family lawn beyond that. Here is a view looking at the community building from that entry plaza. It's really a space again for uh, flexible use. It's a it's a you know a, a sizable space for um, an impromptu event for programming for uh, Denver bike parks um, or potentially for a community event. There's a view looking at the bike playground. View of the splash pad. A view from inside one of the bike playground loops. And so uh, let's get into some details of the parking situation. So what we heard last time was there's too much parking in the plan and the proposed parking is too close to the existing neighborhood and homes. So we really took this to heart and we tried to address this um, as well as we could, understanding that we, we couldn't totally get rid of this parking area as we do need access from Florida and we also need ADA accessible parking spots to get to other portions of the site. Um, and so what we did was we removed 30 spaces from this parking lot here that we showed you last time. We removed all of these spaces and we moved them to other parts of the site. So we added 13 spaces to the existing parking lot. We added 32 spaces to this entry drive that's existing today that leads you to the parking lot for the picnic pavilion. And then we're also going to use some existing parking lot or some existing parking spaces from that lot um, to supplement um, and help us reduce the amount of spaces here. So that's how we handled the parking. Um, I also wanted to show everyone, we cut a section through this area. Um, uh, from the, the proposed parking down the existing topography to the neighborhood homes, just to understand what's going on there and what it's gonna look like. Um, so we've got the existing neighborhood homes, we have an existing fence and some existing trees. Um, we've got the, the walking path that's in there. Um, and then we'll have this new road, this new expanded parking off of the existing road. So we have reoriented all of our spots to be head in towards the park. However, um, you know, someone might back into one of those spots and their headlights could face the homes. So according to the federal highway, um, federal highway transportation and safety authority, uh, typical headlights typically dissipate after 160 feet. So that is um, a little bit before we get to the existing fence. Um, so that we're, we're hoping that with additional trees implanted in this area and knowing that headlights will likely dissipate before we get to the fence, that this will alleviate some of the issues we've been hearing about um, parking and headlights shining into homes. Um, I think we're also exploring adding a berm in this area to completely cut that off. So these are all things that we're exploring and we're actively trying to address this. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Some more things that we heard about uh, recreation was that there was a desire for flat grass uh, lawn area for soccer and other sports, um, a desire for futsal and a desire for a skate park at Ruby Hill. So we did set aside, like I was mentioning, a large flat space uh, that could be used as flexible recreation for soccer and other sports. Um, the hard court could be striped for multiple things, including futsal. And then, as I mentioned before, we added a beginner skate park to the plan. 
So with that, um, I'll, I'll leave it on the concept plan again. And I think at this point, we can open it up for discussion, um, questions, comments. Um, Alex Nuffer, do you mind uh, throwing questions out there from the chat for me? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, one sec. So Ken asked, uh, will trees be planted to make sure we uh, keep the area green? Yes, definitely. And, and I would just add to that, uh, we're, we are planting uh, a lot of new trees as well as trying to maintain, I'd say, almost all of the existing trees on site. We're trying very hard to keep all of those trees that are there today. Um, Jackie said in the chat, the berm seems necessary to address drainage issues with the addition of height to this area. You could cause issues to the homeowners with that topography. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Yeah, so um, let's go back to that section. So, uh, so yeah, so um, our civil engineer is, is looking at this and we're collaborating with him on the best solution for this, but we will absolutely make sure that this does not cause drainage issues and um, any flooding or anything towards neighborhood homes. We're actually required to capture um, and treat all of the runoff on site. So, so that should not be an issue for neighborhood homes. Jace asked, why is this phase of the master plan intentionally and arbitrarily focused on only this area of the park? I will punt that to someone from DPR. Can you repeat that one, Alex? Yeah. It, Jace asks, why is this phase of the master plan intentionally and arbitrarily focused on only this area of the park? Anna Claudia, if you're on, can you take that one? I think it's a little bit more of a planning question. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was trying to read the question because it's a little um, it's a little confused. I'm sorry. I'm and, digesting the question. Jace, I, I will say that at this point we want it to be more of an open conversation. If you're comfortable, you could unmute yourself um and and ask the, the question directly or we could just repeat it wh whatever you prefer sure yeah the the project scope for this phase from the get-go has you guys have told us this many times over that we cannot talk about anything outside of this area of the park um, but there's not really been any reason why this is the only area of the park that's being talked about in this phase when the previous phases of the master plan implementation have generally dealt with the entire park as a whole, which seems like a better way to do things because this park is not a piecemeal park. It's, you know, everything needs to work together pretty holistically. Um, you know, you can't cha make changes in one area without having effects in the rest of the area. So I'm just wondering why such a narrow scope was being forced on this phase. Oh, thanks, Jace, for the clarification. Now I understand better your question. Um, this is a very interesting question. However, uh, the scope uh, was limited to uh, this, this uh, general area. We needed to improve um, the, this area based on the existing conditions. We had an opportunity with um, uh, adding the necessary programming to support the current needs of, of uh, of uh, the, the biking uh, programming that we now have uh, yet to be soon very available over here. We uh, ha also ha did, uh, did have a need of uh, addressing the issues that we have with the pool. Uh, the pool is um, uh, needed to be uh, addressed and, and, and the facility uh, unfortunately uh, won't be able to be viable for the park. So we needed to address that. And within the limited, um, uh, uh, funding that we have for this phase three, uh, we needed to limit the geographical scope of the project. 
uh, with every project that we uh, look at as the phases, yes, you're very true. We, we do tend to look uh, at uh, uh, synergy with uh, implementations throughout um, in relation holistic to the park. In this phase three, I believe we are doing that. We are trying to connect to the proposed circulation of the design with uh, the existing circulation, and that is both uh, vehicular and pedestrian and the natural uh, resources at the same time protecting the trees that we have. So um, in, in, in that sense, we believe we are integrating with existing conditions, um, and but the scope is limited to, to this area, and then there is funding also limited to this area. I hope that answers your question. Great. Uh, Scott wanted to know, was wondering if he could see some more uh, pictures of the skate park. So we don't, or Alex, um, I guess we could run through the model really quick. Yeah. Um, do you want to share your screen, Alex? Sure. That you just have up? to stop sharing yours. Okay. So do you wanna just jump to that skate park area? So like I said before, it will be a, a fairly beginner level skate park which we feel like complements the beginner bike playground well. Um, the master plan has called for uh, a larger skate park somewhere throughout the park. Um, so we didn't want to move that, but we thought that this would be an excellent complement again to the bike playground as well as what that master plan is calling for. So similar to the way that you would start at this bike playground and uh, build up your skills and your confidence and then graduate to the BMX course, you can uh, build up your skate skills here and then graduate to a larger, uh, more complex and um, advanced level skate park. Any other questions about the skate park before we jump back to the plan? Let me check the chat. And feel free to come off mute and just ask them too, if you'd like. And also not a question, sir. Todd did give Central Park as a good example of a beginner skate park. Oh, awesome. Um, so I'm not sure if you all looked at that or are familiar with it. Um, so not direct question, but just a, yeah. uh, a recommendation. Yep, we'll absolutely take a look at that. Um, I have a question as far as uh, what um, is, is there still changes that could be made to this, to the layout of the skate park? I guess, um, how far along in planning are we and is this kind of set in stone? Nope, that's why we're here tonight. Um, if you've got recommendations or input, um, this was, we were trying to lay out an appropriate amount of space. Um, so we're, we're just, at, as, as I said, we just added this program. Um, between the last session and this one. And so we're still, um, there's still room for revisions if you've got input. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be that guy, but I feel like using <laughs> the same amount of concrete, you could make it, uh, you know, the same cost, same space, you could make it a really interesting part. This one just feels, no offense, and I'm glad you guys are focusing on this. This is great, but I don't feel like it would get a lot of use um, as it currently is, but I, I would love to, have an email that I could send ideas to or yeah we'd yeah. love love that yeah that'd be awesome thank you hey, hey Sarah this is a uh, Graydon with Ruby Hill Neighbors and just piggybacking off Alex's comment um just looking at it from the rendering it, it does look very barren and and um and I think just with all that space in the middle it's actually a safety issue I could see folks using it as a uh, as a walkthrough, and, and if you got people on skateboards and and things of that nature zooming past, uh, just potential uh, safety issue there. 
Yeah, yeah. I think um, we, so we have been talking uh, very closely and working very closely throughout this whole project with Deke Brown, who is in charge of Denver Bike Parks, um, to figure out the what skill sets we're trying to build at this skate park, as well as uh, a layout. So this, this really will um, become more developed as we go on. But um, I think it would be great if people wanted to email their ideas um, or in inspirational images to Jennifer, it looks like, she, or Anna Claudia. Um, and we will definitely take those into consideration. And uh, sorry, Sarah, I'm just going to interject here really, really quickly. Uh, we do have a phone number that has their, rate, their hand raised. I saw one of our interpreters had her rent her hand raised earlier. I do want to remind people that the meeting is being interpreted. So if you're going to unmute yourself, if, if you could just speak as clearly as possible so that we're able to capture that question um, and any response. Um, so just be conscious of that, that, that this is being uh, uh, interpreted simultaneously as you all speak. Um, with that, if the phone number, uh, uh, I'll, I'll ask you to unmute yourself. That way you're able to ask a question. Can you can, hear me? Yes, we could hear you now. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is David Reardon. And um, I've been talking with uh, with Deke about the uh, um, adding of the skateboard park into phase three, that last minute thing. And uh, I guess it's called uh, it was called a kitty park or beginner park to me um, by Deke. Uh, my concern is that there is no such thing as a beginner park as such in the skateboard world. And um, what you really have are skateboard parks with smaller features. But that said, it can be done. And we appreciate and we applaud the effort of DPR to put this into phase three. Um, we'd still like to go ahead and reserve our, our uh, ability to go ahead and discuss a bigger park. But with this said, it might, might end up working out for everybody. But what is key is that the skateboard community must be involved in the design phase. Uh, from the very beginning, to um, the selection of a builder of the skateboard park, um, all the way to actually the building of the skateboard park, and then also be involved in a sign off on the skateboard park. Because unfortunately throughout the United States, there's been a number of skateboard parks that have been built for municipalities that are what we call bunk with a B, B-U-N-K, which means that they're junk with a J. And when that happens, it's a waste of taxpayers' money. It's a waste of effort by the, uh, by the community, by the parks, and actually becomes uh, something that is very uh, problematic and, and not something that people want to use. So therefore, I, I uh, want to go ahead and make sure that DPR, in this process of this skateboard park, includes the skateboard community from start to end. And I think that's all I have at this point in time. All right. Thank you very Thank you. much. Um, so, and uh, Claudia, we've had quite a bit of questions on the skate park, but we do have some other questions. Just wondering how you all would want to proceed. That way, uh, we make sure that the skateboard community feels heard, but at the same time, we could get to some of the additional questions that that we have. Alex, do you want to um, Jackie, Jackie has plan? a hand raised. Jackie, if you want to come off. Here. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks. I just didn't want to interrupt anyone. Um, I just wanted to give the opportunity of conversation. I think Ken man mentioned it in the chat uh, a couple comments ago, as well as something that I know we've talked about throughout this process. Um, especially when we are considering the addition of the flat recreational green spaces, the flat recreational courts that are going to be lined out for multiple sports, understanding likely the skate park is going to change, but in this iteration of it being a flat space, um, I just hear four-wheelers four and um, 
cars rolling on through here and destroying all this hard work. So I was curious what safety measures we would be putting into place, be it natural features like boulders or barricades or speed bumps to ensure that people aren't driving from one parking lot to the other over the grass surface and or utilizing these um, flat spaces for things that they are not intended for, like donuts. <laughs> yeah, that's a really great question, Jackie. Thanks for asking it. So um, I guess the answer is a combination of, of things that you mentioned um, and strategies to prevent that from happening. So it is our intent um, at the moment for the new parking lot uh, and drop off to have curb and gutter. So that will be one element. We're also looking to um, use removable bollards. Um, so uh, they can be removed if fire or emergency vehicles need to access the space, but um, your everyday vehicle will not be able to uh, move them. We're also looking at natural features, like you said, um, boulders. So I think there's an example um, in one of these renderings where you can see the splash pad um, in oh, went way too far, sorry about that. Has um, a series of kind of like a low wall of boulders to um, create a barrier between the sidewalk and the parking lot and, and the uses. So I think that we will um, employ those throughout the park, as well as looking into speed bumps um, uh, throughout the, the drive, the drives. The, the other thing I guess I would just say is that um, in addition to moving the, or removing parking spaces, um, we've tried to make this uh, a, a one-way or a, a narrow road so that there is not actually enough room to conduct a, a donut in this space. They will find room. <laughs> That's what I'm <laughs> concerned about. Yeah, I mean, we need to, I guess, find a, a middle space between providing parking, providing accessible parking, and trying to make that um, the least, uh, I guess, accessible to donuts as possible. Um, Sarah, there's a question about um, the flexible recreation and whether the fields are large enough to paint a whole field, uh, a soccer field, if needed. Um, if so, would it be set up to do youth sports? So I can't speak to the programming. Currently, what's being shown fits a youth rec field. So it's not... Um, it's not uh, officially a size, I don't think, where you could play a game. Um, I see also a comment about a paved skate park next to a paved basketball court. Um, and so I think something that we could do if there was community uh, want is incorporate that basketball court to become a uh, more of the grass lawn um, and that would be, allow us to accommodate a larger soccer field. As far as youth programming goes, I, I can't speak to that personally. Current, uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, from a DPR side, there's not an anticipated permitted use on these fields just because of the size allocations. Uh, we have some few hands raised. Uh, Graydon, do you want to come off mute? Yeah, appreciate it. Um, to our, our conversation here with the sports court and the field, um, I wanted to ask first, uh, forgive me if I missed it, but what is the, what's the inspiration behind the bike playground in that we have an extensive bike park off to the south there and i guess that ties in with my comments of i, I think it would be really important to have a full-size recreational field there for soccer um i think we're you know underrepresenting you know demographics in our neighborhood there and and then i also think having keeping a sports court is important as well, either for basketball and or pickleball, please no tennis. 
Thank you. Um, I can, Jennifer, I can uh, take a stab at this one and uh, or anyone else from DPR if you wanna add to it. Thank you for your question, Graydon. I think it's a good one. Um, the intent of the bike playground is different from how the current BMX park functions. So this is really an opportunity for uh, Denver Bike Parks, which is a part of DPR, to um, uh, have a home base with their community building, um, which will also house a gear library for kids to rent bikes, um, skis and snowboards for the rail yard, as well as uh, protective equipment and gear. Uh, they'll also host programming uh, for um, learning about cycling, snowboarding, skiing, how to fix a bike, um, and then how to learn learn how to ride a bike for the first time. So this is really a place for beginners to get their footing, to learn how to balance on a bike, to learn how to start to navigate topography and different uh, paved elements, and then they can graduate onto that more difficult BMX park um, that is currently existing in the park. Um, but uh, I, and I guess the, the only thing I'll, I'll say is that um, it was decided not to put pickleball in this uh, park um, due to the uh, higher cost of the infrastructure that's needed for pickleball. It needs a post-tension slab. It needs uh, fencing all the way around it. Um, and due to the fact that there are, I think, multiple pickleball courts within, I, I believe, a three-mile radius. I, 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 I would look to DPR to expand more on that. Yeah, pickleball was <clears throat> not included because we do have a pickleball master plan within DPR and Ruby Hill was not identified as a high use zone. Houston or Huston, depending on how you pronounce it, is fairly close by and also has pickleball as well as a few other locations, but basketball I believe was shown in the master plan so that's kind of why it was included in this concept design that being said when we did add the skate park we do realize that that greatly increases the amount of hard skate so one of the main items for this meeting was to get feedback on that if the community wanted to see that basketball court maintained or if you would prefer that it's removed in its entirety so there aren't any necessarily hard skate courts and that space could be um, reused as more of a flexible softscape, greenscape, or it could be used to increase the barrier between the skate park and a few of the other amenities. Great, next question in the chat. Uh, between the 2019 plan and current plan, has the amount of green space been reduced, stayed the same, or has it increased? I think that's a great question. I don't have the answer for that off the top of my head. I'm not sure if DPR does, but I think that's something that we could absolutely uh, calculate and include on the FAQ, or I, I don't want to speak for you. I'll, I'll let someone else chime in. <laughs> yeah, and Anna Claudia, add to this if you need, but unfortunately, we didn't get this posted in time, but there isn't a question and answer document, a PDF in English and Spanish with the questions that we received during phase one of community outreach. And we will post that to the website soon. If you're not familiar, it's a denvergov.org backslash park projects. And then you can search for Ruby Hill and I'll put that in the chat, but we'll be doing the same for round two. So I know we're at 6, 17 PM. So if you don't get your question answered, be sure and make sure, be um, aware that we will for sure answer you and it just might be in a different format, but there will be a phase two question and answer document that will post the website as well. Great, Becca, you have your hand raised if you wanna come off mute. Yeah, hi, Um. thank you. I was just curious because I, didn't see like this labeled as a basketball court and I thought I just felt like from the last meeting a lot of people were kind of mentioning that we have so many basketball courts in the neighborhood in the surrounding area and 
I guess, and then obviously, like in the beginning of this, it was mentioned that, you know, possibly being painted to be used for multiple uses. And so I guess what's the idea behind that? Like what other uses would this court um, be utilized for if it's not like pickleball or tennis or, you know, like, I guess I just don't really understand what other um, uses we could get out of it. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, from our survey results from the last public engagement meeting, we had a lot of comments and uh, uh, comments about futsal, um, which is a hardcore sport, um, as well as um, it could also be striped for um, well uh, various things. But that was that was the the main two sports that we heard. And then, sorry, can I just ask a follow-up? So if it is striped yeah. for multiple, like, I guess, how do you handle that? Like, do people schedule times? I guess, like, I just don't really understand, like, is it is it just kind of a first come, first serve? Like, you know, if someone's going to be playing basketball, I don't know. I guess that just, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a first come, first serve. Okay. Okay. Um, next question in the chat uh, by Brandy. Aren't there issues with planting new trees in Ruby Hill Park due to potential asbestos buried beneath the sod? Uh, you want to speak to that, Sarah? Yeah. There is one other one on there, Alex, too, and I can answer it, Sarah, if you want me oh, to. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I <Go> do. <laughs> okay. So there was also a question about size of trees that we're going to be planting, and unfortunately, we can't plant very large trees that are of a 10 to 15 year maturity size. Denver forestry really promotes us planting two and a half inch to three inch caliper trees. And that's really based on, well, one pricing, 10 to 15 year old trees are very expensive and unfortunately wouldn't work with the budget of this project, but they also don't survive as well. Transplanting that large of trees typically doesn't go well in Denver just because of our dry high altitude climate. So the trees that will be planted will be that two and a half to three inch caliper. Um, and to get to Brandy's question, typically our operation staff isn't able to plant new trees in Ruby Hill because of the asbestos and rachis issues with the soil. Um, as most of you know on this call, Ruby Hill was a dump site for quite a long time before it was a park. So there is quite a bit of um, material that can be harmful within the soil. And our operations crews aren't um, fit to deal with that type of rackets. It has to be remediated and handled with uh, great care and then taken to a very specific area of the landfill. But because we're doing such a large phase three plan and project, we'll be handling the rackets and the soil contamination on a much larger scale. So when we go to plant those trees, the soil that we remove will be um, taken care of with the rest of the soil from the construction site. Thanks, Jennifer. Next question. It sounds like accessibility is a big reason why the new parking lot is being kept in the plan despite a very widespread disapproval by the resident stakeholders. If this is the case, will all these spots be handicapped only? Uh, they will not all be handicapped. Uh, it will come down to code requirements, but uh, there, there does need to be uh, a certain number of spaces in this area um, in order to get to some of the uses on this side of the park. Uh, next question, what do these spaces look like at night? Where, does light, where are lighting features being added? Um, Jennifer, do you wanna answer this one? <laughs> yeah, I can answer that one. So the precedent within Ruby Hill is to have security lighting, and we're gonna carry through with that precedent. So there will be some additional lighting within the parking and drive areas, as well as security lighting added to the building itself. The intent of phase three is not to be used as a um, night spot. In other words, we're not adding significant amounts of overhead or pedestrian lights to encourage people to be in this space after dark. The lighting that is being added is solely for that security purpose. Um, and just as a note, the, what you're seeing here on the concept is pushing the boundaries of our, our budget. 
our budget right now is $8 million and that's for design and construction. Um, and as I'm sure you guys are aware from the news, we're experiencing high levels of escalation that's requiring us to really just bear down on that budget so that we can make sure that we deliver what we say we're gonna deliver. So anything additional, including making this like a night use zone would require removing something from the scope. Um, this next question is for DPR. How can our community advocate for a comprehensive review of the park? We keep requesting a loop around the park, connectivity to Levitt to address ADA and safety concerns, and we never get anywhere. If the park is always going to be designed in segments, these issues caused by DPR's piecemeal approach will never get addressed. Jennifer, I can, I yeah. can take you this. Yeah. That one? <laughs> Yeah, I believe again, this is a um, the the park framework loop that has been communicated by the community for for a very long time. I believe our leadership has uh, responded to this question in the past. And again, the uh, framework of the walking loop is outside this scope. Um, I am um, happy to continue this conversation offline of this project so we can really uh, open up for discussions and listen more concerns about the community about this. Um, the walking loop is not part of this project and uh, I'm happy to continue the discussions uh, offline uh, outside this project scope. And sorry, it was my son arriving from uh, daycare and quite the entrance. Uh, next question, a paved skate park next to a paved basketball court, court next to a paved area. Oh, Alex, I think we talked about oh. this. Sorry about that. Um, can we get curbs on the roads like a like is listed on page 37 of the master plan under the priority ones from the impl implementation plan. I'll let DPR answer that one. Alice, can you repeat that question for me? Yes. <clears throat> can we get curbs on the roads like is listed on page 37 of the master plan under the priority ones from the implementation plan? Uh, you mean uh, curb and gutter? I believe so, yes. Um, Speak to that one. If that's you that's interesting. That's very sp specific. And I believe there is uh, investigation of adding uh, curb and gutter as, uh, as, as feasible here on this project. I'll let Jennifer add to this topic. Yeah, so currently, right now, within the limit of work that we're dealing with in phase three, we are planning on adding curb and gutter to the new parking and drive areas. I know that was a request from our operations team as well as the community to hopefully mitigate to the full extent, but try and keep people off of the <laughs> non-drivable park assets. Um, so we are keeping that within the plan right now. And then as far as park-wide, I think that is a a high asset that we're trying to integrate and we'll hopefully be able to do so in future phases. I just wanted to touch on a, a couple comments that piggyback off of what we've talked about. So um, there was a comment about uh, the trees and, and their size. So um, and in the renderings, we are showing trees at their mature height, but I, I would also just like to emphasize that we are um, trying to maintain as many existing trees as possible, um, which is which is almost all of them in this kind of uh, oval area where most of the programming is. So there will be mature, and the trees existing today are, are mature and quite lovely. So we are doing our best to keep those trees. Um, and then I did see another question, if the size of the park is not changing, why is more parking added? And that's because we are adding a lot more programming. And so more people will be coming to this part of the park um, in the summer, as well as people who come 
to use the rail yard in the winter. Yeah, and if I can jump in just one more yeah. little blurb on trees. So we do have to remove a few trees in order to add these new assets, but just so the community is aware, the forestry department does require us to replace trees um, either with caliper number of new trees or by adding dollars to a tree planting fund that would go to trees in Ruby Hill at large. So if we are to remove any trees, please be um, aware that we will be adding them either in this project specifically or in the future via the tree planting fund. So I see there's already more parking in this park than any other park in the city. Um, so I don't have those numbers, but I would just say we've gotten uh, feedback from some of our stakeholders that uh, there's actually more parking needed today for the rail yard. Um, and I would also say that there are a lot of really cool uses in this park, such as the rail yard, the BMX park and Leather pavilion. Um, so that may be some of the reason for some of this parking. Yeah, and I know Graydon has his hand raised, but real quickly, Sarah, just to piggyback off of what you said, I don't know if those on this call, I, I hadn't been out to Ruby Hill until um, the rail yard event last Saturday or two Saturdays ago, and parking was a huge issue. So we're trying to address phase three for daily use as well as event use. Um, and I know during the first public outreach meeting, there was concern about the entry plaza being too big and too much hard seat. And that space is supposed to be used <clears throat> kind of as a drop off pickup zone, but also as an event space. So for rail yard events, when we have um, shelters or you know tents for vendors or whatnot, they can set up there on that entry plaza instead of the often muddy or um, grassy hillscape. Alex, can you show the entry plaza? Yeah, one second. Just, just to have a better understanding of scale. Sorry, just reloading it. Can you see it? Yep, thank you. And so this is a view from that plaza that we were just looking at. Uh, spill out space for, the, for that building, um, as well as a flex space for, like Jennifer was mentioning, pop-up tents, event setup, not just for Denver bike parks, but also um, for other community events. Alex, are there any are there any other questions in the chat that we haven't gone to? Um, you sure? Yeah, yeah. Graydon could go. Appreciate it. Um, so currently in the park there, um, there's a cement path that runs uh, south north it's on the you know west side of the park there runs along the uh, back of the uh, neighbor's houses uh is that involved in your guys's um phase three of the plan and i guess i ask because currently it is um pretty much impossible to to bike ride skateboard 
uh, rollerblade, anything. It, it's very unsafe. It's, you know, there's cracks, ridges, things of that nature. I know it's a, a very small detail, but I was wondering if that's uh, involved in this plan. And then uh, it just it sounds like anything you folks, uh, you know, decide on is going to work. You know, be, you know it's going to work out, but the parking seems to be the big issue and is our concern here in the neighborhood. And I was wondering if you guys have, like, looked into even a fence around the line of the parking there or a hedge. Um, I was curious you know, about I mean, maybe putting a hedge there because it sounds like the trees are going to be small and they're going to take some time to grow. And, um, yeah, just curious about you guys' insight and uh, thoughts on that. Appreciate it. Yeah, good question. Thank you. So the walking path um, may end up being disturbed uh, depending on the grading, uh, how the grading plan will work out in this area. But uh, Jennifer, I believe our intent is to replace it if, if that does get disturbed. Is that right, Jennifer? Yes, if that walking path is disturbed, the idea is to maintain it so that that access point is still present after phase three. Yeah, and then uh, as far as the, the parking, again, we have really taken to heart the concerns and have tried to um, move parking further away from the neighborhood to the greatest extent possible, as well as exploring these options, like you say, a hedge or a berm. We're actively exploring a berm, absolutely. Um, the new trees that will be planted while small are uh, will be a mixture of both deciduous and evergreen. The advantage of the evergreen is that they, one, absorb more noise, uh, and two, they are lower to the ground. Um, so they will provide a better screen, even if they're small. Um, and then the other thing I'd say is there are quite a bit of um, existing trees in the neighborhood existing along the existing fence line that butts up against their property. But we are, we are doing everything we can to find um, the best possible solution for the programming of this park and the neighborhood. And I, I think Sarah, it might be worth noting that there is Excel power lines in that area. So we have contacted them and are working closely with our Excel liaison, but that's why the berm hasn't been completely detailed out is because we have to get special permission from that utility provider to do any grading within that easement. Um, ask can the new parking spots be moved to the other side of the new features. If there is so much opposition, I hope creative ideas can be created. Um, I think the advantage and the logic behind the, the parking spaces in this area um, is that there is already an existing road. So all we are adding is this turnaround um, as well as these spots here. We're building off of this existing road. Um, there is quite a bit of topography here, um, as well as the views to the park. And I think what we've been trying to discourage is adding more road. Um, so again, we've tried to utilize existing infrastructure within the park um, and not disturb more area than we need to. Alex, is there any questions um, that we missed or does anyone wanna, is anyone raising their hand? I can't Let's see. A um, couple more questions coming in. Um, there's a question about a uh, walkthrough that can ask, can we schedule a walkthrough of the park in a broader meeting with DPR, the mayor's office and city council?
Yeah, and yeah. Do you want to take that one? Ken's original question was asking if there's a way to get with council, the neighborhood, and DPR to create a walkthrough of the project and future phases so that questions about safety in that full park access loop are addressed. I think his original question was concerned about piecemealing these phases together and those two items never being considered. Yeah, absolutely. We can schedule something with our leadership and coordinate with city council. I cannot speak availability of mayor, but we can definitely contact the liaison and see if it is something that um, that team is available. Uh, we've done walkthroughs in the past for sure, and we definitely encourage uh, the community uh, if, if you guys want to meet us over there. Um, I will coordinate with uh, city council to see what's the best time, and then we can get back to the community on that. And I would add that the consultants and the people on this project should be a part of that, just considering, Jennifer, you said yourself you hadn't been out there until the event last a couple weeks ago. Like, um, a lot of this looks really great in the mock-ups, but the reality of it, to second Brandy's um, comment that she just had that was really great, is like the reality of living next to this park is... Um, much not as pretty as the pictures are and having some of these safety concerns and bikeability, walkability, safety, top to bottom, back and forth isn't necessarily captured here. So uh, that would just be my one addition to that email list is that the people on this project be primary. I'd like to piggyback, piggyback off of Brandy's comment because I think it's extremely valid. Um, and just thinking out loud um, about more potential ways to try to reduce that kind of vehicular behavior that we're trying to prevent. Um, so I guess the first thing I would say is that we're, we're not adding any, we're adding more parking spaces. Um, I wouldn't say we're, we're adding more parking lots. So the width of the road that's existing is remaining today. I'm wondering if you know, in this, if you can see my cursor, in this area where there is uh, parallel parking off to one side and head-in parking off to the other, the amount of paved surface does increase there. So I'm wondering if we, if we can look into one, of course, adding speed bumps, but two, incorporating uh, more parking islands to reduce that width and try to uh, create a smaller area that would not be conducive for donuts, so we can certainly look into more ideas like this to, to get people to um, slow down and uh, drive carefully and respectfully. Sarah, this is Brandy. Um, oh my gosh, we have been asking for speed bumps for so many years, just that would help so much. If that is something that we can actually get, we've been told year after year after year that it's it impedes emergency vehicles and things like that but yeah if there were speed bumps and things of that nature like there are in other parks around Denver it would greatly greatly help um yeah that would be awesome uh there's a question will the multi-use courts have goals and basketball hoops Yes, if striped for basketball, if that uh, is what um, is that, if that's the feedback that we're getting, then they would have hoops. Um, sorry, can I just ask? I think I'm more concerned about it being if it is multi-use. I'm I'm personally less concerned about the the hoops um, and more concerned oh. that the basketball would take over the courts themselves, and that even though they're striped for other activities. Like they wouldn't truly be created or developed and with the other activities in mind, if it is going to be futsal and or whatever else is determined, I guess I just want to make sure like, will it truly be, will you be able to use it for all these other purposes or will it just have lines and like, oh, you can come play, but like, there's not really goals there to play futsal or whatever. The case oh, is. I see. Um, 
Is someone from TPR um, maybe can speak to this? If if striped for futsal, would that include goals? I, Anna Claudia, you can fix me if I'm wrong. I don't know if we have a real strong precedent for futsal courts within DPR. However, that being the case, this might, I can't promise this. So this is just me talking out loud, but because we have this building here, it might be a potential location where those football futsal goals could be rented or moved out during daytime hours for use and placed back into the building. Yeah, I believe there is an opportunity for us to explore, um, you know, how we can facilitate goals uh, if they are not permanent installed uh, within uh, additional to the basketball uh, hoops. We definitely can look into um, the, the availability of, of bringing and also the community can bring their own. Um, I, I believe when the uh, court is a uh, flexible court and is striped, uh, the intent is that the community will self-organize and, and, and organize their, their games around what they want to play, but we definitely will accommodate any uh, necessary uh, amenity to make the flexible core functional. Okay, sorry. So just to confirm that the community is expected to bring their own goals or it will be something that's provided if that's what it's striped for? I, what I said, it can be both. It's something that uh, we we'll, we'll definitely will uh, determine when we uh, evolve the design a little bit. If we are, uh, we definitely don't provide um, uh, additional amenities. If the community wants to bring their own goals, they can bring it. If we are programming a court to be flexible for it, um, the intent is for us to provide uh, all the amenities necessary for the flexible core to be functional. So what I'm trying to say is both. It can be both. If uh, if uh, we have this uh, building that has this opportunity to house um, uh, uh, program um, equipment, if it's something that is necessary, um, I'm thinking about smaller um, smaller goals for kids. Usually, I, uh, I'm, the reason I'm saying that is I do take my son to soccer practice uh, in the summer. And usually there, there is uh, portable ones that they bring. So I'm thinking more like in the, those lines, there's definitely opportunity for, uh, for, for this program to evolve per the community need. Okay, thank you. And Sarah, correct me if I'm misspeaking, but I believe we are gonna post a second public survey, correct? Yeah, it will be, um, it will just be to obtain general feedback. Um, it, it will be a lot simpler than the last one, but there will be an opportunity to do that. Yeah, and I think one of the questions we might try to have on there is how people wanna see that space. If it sh should be multi-use court hardscape, if it should be more of a green space um, or how the community wants to see that programmed. So I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. I think this meeting was supposed to end at 6.30. Um, are there any, any last comments um, or questions before we conclude? I don't know if anyone has their hand raised, Alex, or if there's anything in the chat. Um. No hands raised, but uh, Megan says DPR should think about the demographics of this community. While many uh, of the kids love soccer, for example, they can't equip and bring their own nets. Great comment. And then I would like to just address the second half of that comment. So I think one of the coolest things about this project is that, uh, and I guess I, I will read the comment, uh, we should make sure equity is top of mind with this park. So many of the park features are hardcore, bike park, rail yard, et cetera, but much of the community don't have access to that kind of equipment. And so I, I think one of the most exciting parts about this project and uh, one of my 
favorite things is that this new building will act, will act as a gear library. And so the same way that you go to the library and check out a library book, kids will be able to come to this building and check out a bike like they would a library book, check out a skateboard, uh, borrow a helmet, check out skis and snowboards. Um, and so equity is, is definitely at the heart of this project and is a, is a top priority. So I think with that, we will conclude the meeting. Uh, please check out the DPR website that Jennifer posted in this chat um, for the community engagement FAQ, as well as the uh, survey where you can leave additional, leave additional comments and questions. But I really appreciate everybody uh, joining today and asking your questions. I thought this was a really great discussion. Um, so thank you very much.